Hello, I'm Bob Orr, and this is Washington Unplugged. Terror suspect Najibullah Zazi this morning was indicted by a federal grand jury in New York on one count of conspiracy to use one or more weapons of mass destruction within the United States. The government now has asked the court for permanent detention, and that means Zazi very likely will soon be moved from Colorado to New York to await trial. The terror charge was revealed just a short time before Zazi appeared along with his father at a detention hearing in Denver. In court documents released this morning, the Justice Department says Zazi and unnamed others, quote, purchased large quantities of hydrogen peroxide and acetone products from beauty supply stores in the Denver metropolitan area. The government says evidence, including surveillance videos, will prove that Zazi and the others made repeated purchases of those chemicals over the last three months, beginning in July of 2009. Now, you need to know that hydrogen peroxide and acetone sometimes can be key ingredients for making homemade explosives. In fact, those chemicals have been used in the past for various terrorist attacks and attempts, including the London bombings in 2005 on the transit system there, and the ill-fated Richard Reed shoe bomb attempt in 2001. The court documents do not identify any co-conspirators or any of the targets and shed no new light on the scale of Zazi's intended plot. But the newly re uh, revealed evidence, coupled with the discovery of backpacks and cell phones in the recent raids in New York, add to the growing suspicion that Zazi and his partners were working on something, on developing portable bombs for use against multiple targets and we're told likely in New York. The FBI right now is continuing to press the search for other potential conspirators and a possible cache of explosive materials. No new arrests have yet been announced. It's a lot to take in, but with me now to talk about all of this is our national security analyst, uh, Juan Zarate. That's just kind of a summary, Juan. That's a great summary, Bob. And it's a lot of detail, but what do you make of this? It certainly seems from this that, uh, that the feds think this guy's the real deal. Well, absolutely. I think uh, today we've seen in print exactly what we've been hearing from authorities uh, in print uh, as well as uh, behind the scenes. And that is that Zazi was a central player in a plot uh, to attack some site in New York. We're not sure where or how. Uh, and that there was a confederation of individuals, not clear what size, uh, what that network looks like, um, or if they're still out there, unidentified. And so what this uh, indictment does is it really uh, sharpens the focus on what Zazi was planning on doing, uh, what the plot was starting to look like as we reached September 11th, uh, and why, frankly, authorities were so concerned and why they decided to disrupt the case when they did. There's a whole lot of detail in there. What struck me is that other people, now they don't name the people in the papers, but other people went with Zazi or went along with Zazi in purchasing these materials, which seems to say that there are people at least had knowledge of some of his activities, if not his intentions. Right. It, it's not yet clear, uh, again, what we're talking about in terms of the network or what they were aware of. And I think one of the main challenges for the FBI at this point is figuring out what the constellation of actors looks like. Uh, who was involved? Uh, how much did they know? Uh, are there other individuals who may be playing central roles and have contacts back in Pakistan like Zazi did? Uh, I think what's striking about this is not only the, the detail of his preparations for a potential attack, uh, but also the urgency that he seemed to attach to some of the bomb-making activities uh, leading up to September 11th. And I think that in combination with the history of his communications back to Pakistan, potentially to al-Qaeda senior leadership, uh, raised some huge red flags for authorities and led to the disruptions. There's an interesting passage in the papers that talks about Zazi's contacts with someone else, an unnamed person, but the same person, and repeated phone calls that gain more and more urgency as he seems to be trying to get something right. That's somewhat alarming, don't you think? It's alarming and uh, it explains why authorities were so concerned when Zazi decided to make the cross-country trip from Colorado to New York. Uh, there was something happening in a foot in New York, not only contacts and communications, but what appeared to be final stage preparations. Uh, and so, again, what authorities are trying to figure out is uh, by canvassing uh, local uh, you know, uh, stores, by talking to, to neighbors, talking to all sorts of folks, what was happening in Denver, in the Denver area, what was happening in New York, who knew what, and what does this network look like? And this is still an unfolding case but today we've started to see some of the, the details that give this granularity. Zazi and the others, according to the government, bought acetone, hydrogen peroxide in larger volumes than normal. Backpacks were found in New York. Cell phones were found in New York. What does that sound like to you? 
Well, as you mentioned at the top, uh, it starts to look and smell a little bit like the yeah. London attacks um, uh, or some version of the Madrid attacks. And that's in part why I think we saw uh, announcements and warnings uh, from the FBI and then later the Department of Homeland Security uh, for increased vigilance uh, in uh, subways and metros as well as in uh, soft targets like uh, hotels and, and sport, sporting stadiums. Um, you know, authorities just aren't clear what they have here, uh, and that's part of the challenge. Uh, Attorney General Holder mentioned in his statement that uh, he believes that this plot has been disrupted, but he's not sure, uh, and that's why the public has to remain vigilant, and I think that's why you saw some of the announcements from the Department of Homeland Security recently. I've been told by a number of people that, that this potentially could be the most significant U.S.-based terrorism investigation since 9-11. Does that track with what you hear? Uh, it's what people are saying. Um, I think that's right to a certain extent given the fact that not only do you have preparations for an attack, we've seen that before in a homegrown context. For example, the Fort Dix cell, the Lackawanna cell, uh, to a certain extent the Liberty 7 in, down in Florida. Um, but what you have here that makes this so dangerous is the fact that uh, Zazi appears to have been trained by al-Qaeda uh, in Pakistan, appears to have not only contacts with al-Qaeda, but seemed to have been deployed here uh, at the direction of al-Qaeda's senior leadership. Uh, and that's really what makes this different than other cases. Bear in mind, though, that we had a number of cases early after 2001, uh, Padilla. Uh, everyone remembers the Padilla case. Uh, we remember the Iman Ferris case in the Ohio. The man who apparently was going to try to take down the Brooklyn Bridge. Exactly. Ferris yeah. was going to take down the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, Almari, who was recently uh, indicted uh, soon after President Obama took, took over, uh, who was uh, directed here by Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, and actually landed on September 10th and was supposed to be part of a, of a post-September 11th mm -hmm. uh, wave of attacks. And so we've seen al-Qaeda trying to reach into the homeland before, but all of this kind of predated September 11th. What you have now is a real post-9-11 plot directed by al-Qaeda reaching into the homeland. That makes it different in kind from some of the things we've seen recently. And finally, l let me just ask you about this. Usually, the FBI, when they have someone under surveillance, and this, in this case they had pretty good surveillance, they like to see that mature. The British authorities are very good about letting something mature so that the leaders uh, lead the authorities to the other tentacles of the plot. Here, they had to move very quickly to disrupt something they were unsure about. How much harder does that make, make this for the FBI to untangle this? Um, this makes it much harder. I think you're absolutely right that uh, in an ideal situation, the FBI would have let this case run, as they call it, mm -hmm. and uh, would have watched uh, Zazi, would have watched uh, who he was meeting with, where he was traveling, with whom he was talking. Uh, but a couple of factors uh, went into the early disruption. One, their concern about what was actually happening, not understanding completely what was at play, given the fact that you had the September 11th anniversary, given that you had the U.S. Open, given that you had the President coming to New York, given that you had the U.N. General Assembly uh, about to convene. So all of this transpired. In addition, you had uh, a source. Uh, we now know the Imam who's uh, in, in jail in New York, Afzali, uh, who actually tipped Zazi off. So uh, you read in the court papers today the point at which Zazi becomes aware that federal authorities are starting to look at him uh, and he grows suspicious. And at that point, given the lack of awareness of what the plot was, was, uh, was, what was transpiring and the fact that Zazi knew he was being watched, led authorities to disrupt. And just a couple of footnotes. We should say now that uh, the hearings are over in New York and in Denver. The Denver ones continued. Uh, the uh, Imam Afzali has been uh, released on bail, $1.5 million. And uh, Zazi's father has been released uh, without bail. Uh, but Zazi remains in detention, and we expect him to come to New York. Right. Juan Zarate, our national security analyst, thanks as always. Thank you, Bob. And thanks to all of you for watching Washington Unplugged. Of course, we're here every weekday at 1230 p.m. on CBSNews.com. I'm Bob Orr. Have a good day.